Heartburn by Florence Kalisher. The light, gritty wind of a spring morning blew in on the doctor's shining, clear desk and on the tall button hook of a man who leaned agitatedly toward him. I have some kind of small animal lodged in my chest, said the man. He coughed, a slight hollow apology of his ailment, and sank back in his chair. Animal, said the doctor after a pause, which had the unfortunate quality of comment. His voice, however, was practiced, deft, colored only with the careful suspension of judgment. Probably a form of newt or toad, answered the man, speaking with clipped distaste, as if he would dissociate himself from the idea as far as possible. His face quirked with sad foreknowledge. Of course you don't believe me, the doctor looked at him noncommittally, paraphrased an old refrain of the poker table. Paraphrase an old refrain of the poker table leapt erratically to his mind. Nits, no, newts and gnats and one-eyed jacks, he thought. But already the anecdote was shaping itself, trim and perfectly for display at the clinic lunching table. Go on, he said. Why won't any of you come right out and say what you think? The man said angrily. Then he flushed, not hectically, the doctor noted, but with the well-bred embarrassment of the normally reserved. Sorry, I didn't mean to be rude. You've already had an examination? The doctor was a neurologist, and most of his patients were referrals. My family doctor, I live up in Boston. Did you tell him, er... The doctor sought gingerly for a phrase. One corner of the man's mouth lifted, as if he had watched others in the same dilemma. I went through the routine first. Fluoroscope, metabolism, cardiograph, even gastroscopy. Even gastroscopy. Gastroscopy. Ah, gastroscopy. He spoke. The doctor noted, with the regrettable glibness of the patient who had shopped around, who has shopped around. And the findings? Said the doctor, already sure of the answer. The man leaned forward, holding the doctor's glance with his own. A faint smile rippled his mouth. Positive. Positive. Well, said the man. The machines have to be interrupted, after all, don't they? He attempted to shrug, but the quick eye of the doctor saw that the movement masked a slight contortion within his tweed suit, as if the man writhed away from himself but concealed it quickly, as one masks a hiccup with a cough. A curious flutter in the cardiograph, a strange variation in the metabolism, an alien shadow under the fluoroscope. He coughed again and put a genteel hand over his mouth, but this time the doctor saw it clearly, the slight cringing motion. You see added the man, his eyes helpless and apologetic above the polite covering hand. It's alive. It travels. Yes, yes, of course, said the doctor soothingly now. In his mind hung the word, ovoid and perfect as a drop of water about to fall. Obsession, a beautiful case, he thought again at the luncheon table. What did your doctor recommend? He asked. A place with more resources, like the Mayo Clinic. It was then that I told him I knew what it was, as I've told you, and how I acquired it. The visitor paused. Then, of course, he was forced to pretend to believe me, to pretend he believed me. Forced? said the doctor. Well, said the visitor, actually, I think he did believe me. People tend to believe anything these days. All this mass media information gives them the habit. It takes a strong individual to disbelieve evidence. The doctor was confused and annoyed. Well, what then? He said. Preemptorily. Preemptorily, ready to rise from his desk. In dismissal, again, came the fleeting bodily grimace and the quick cough. He, er, he gave me a prescription. The doctor raised his eyebrows in a gesture he was swift to retract as unprofessional. For heartburn, I think it was, added the visitor demurely. Tipping back in his chair, the doctor tapped a pencil on the edge of his desk. Did he suggest you seek help on another level? May have suggested it, said the man. But I'm not a psychiatrist, said the doctor irritably. Oh, I know that. You see, I came to you because I had the luck to hear one of your lectures at the academy. The one on overemphasis of the non-somatic causes of nervous disorders. 
It takes a strong man to go against the tide like that, a disbeliever, and that's what I sorely need. The visitor shuddered, this time letting the frisian pass uncontrolled. You see, he added, thrusting his clasped hands forward on the desk and looking ruefully at the doctor, as if he would cushion him against his next remark. You see, I am a psychiatrist. The doctor sat still in his chair. Ah, I can't help knowing what you are thinking, said the man. I would think the same, a streamlined version of the Napoleonic delusion. He reached into his breast pocket, drew out a wallet, and fanned papers from it on the desk. Never mind, I believe you, said the doctor hastily. Already? said the man sadly, reddening. The doctor hastily looked over the collection of letters, cards of membership in professional societies, licenses, and so on. Very much the same sort of thing he himself would have had to amass. <clears throat> had he been under the same necessity of proving his identity. Sanity, of course, was another matter. The documents were all issued to Dr. Curtis Retz at a Boston address, stolen, possibly, by something in the man's manner. In fact, everything in it except his unfortunate hallucination made the doctor think otherwise. Poor guy, he thought, occupational fatigue, perhaps. But what a form, the Boston variant, possibly. Suppose you start from the beginning, he said benevolently, if you can spare the time. I have no more appointments until lunch, and what a lunch that'll be, the doctor thought, already cherish cherishing the pop-eyed scene. Travis, the clinic's director, a plethoric nester, the young Grunberg, all of whose cases were unique, and his hairy nostrils dilated for once in a mise-en-scene which he did not dominate holding his hands pressed formally against his chest, almost in the attitude of one of the minor placatory figures in a pieta, the visitor went on. I have the usual private practice, he said, and clinic affiliations. As a favor to an old friend of mine, headmaster of a boys' school nearby, I've acted as guidance counselor there for some years. The school caters to boys of above-average intelligence and is run along progressive lines. Nothing ever cropped up except run-of-the-mill adolescent problems, colored a little perhaps by the type of parents who tend to send their children to a school like that, people who are, well, one might say almost tediously aware of their commitments as parents. The doctor grunted. He was that kind of parent himself. Shortly after the second term began, the head asked me to come, ba come down. He was worried over a sharp drop of morale, which seemed to extend over the whole school, General inattention to class in classes, excited note passing, nightly disturbances in the dorms, all pointing, he had thought at first, to the existence of some fancier than usual form of hazing, or to one of those secret societies, sometimes laughable, sometimes with overtones of the corrupt, with which all schools are familiar, except for one thing, after the other, a long list of boys had been sent to the infirmary by the various teachers who presided in the dining room. Each of the boys had shown a marked debility and what the resident doctor called all the stigma of pure fright, complete unwillingness to confide. Each of the boys pleaded stubbornly for his own release, and a few broke out of their own accord. The interesting thing was that each child did recover shortly after his own release, and it was only after this that another boy was seen to fall ill. No two were affected at the same time. Check the food, said the doctor, all done before I got there. According to my friend, all the trouble seemed to have started with the advent of one boy, John Hallowell, a kid of about 15 who had come to school late in the term with a history of having run away from four other schools. Records at these classed him as very bright, but made oblique references to personality difficulties, which were not defined. My friend's school, ordinarily pretty independent, had taken the boy at the insistence of old Simon Hallowell, the boy's uncle, who is a trustee. His brother, the boy's father, is well known for his marital exploits, which have nourished the tabloids for years. The mother lives mostly in France and South America, one of those perennial dryads, apparently, with a youthfulness maintained by money and a yearly immersion in the fountains of American plastic surgery. Only time, only time she sees the boy, well, you can imagine, what the feature articles call a broken home. The doctor shifted in his chair and lit a cigarette. I won't keep you much longer, said the visitor. I saw the boy. A violent fit of coughing interrupted him. This time, his curious writhing motion 
went frankly unconcealed, he got up from his chair and stood at the window, gripping the sill and breathing heavily until he had regained control and went on, one hand pulling unconsciously at his collar. Or, at least, I think I saw him. On my way to visit him in his room, I bumped into a tall, red-headed boy on a, in a football sweater, hurrying down the hall with a windbreaker and a poncho slung over his shoulder. I asked for Hollowell's room. He jerked a thumb over his shoulder at the door just behind him and continued past me. It never occurred to me. I was expecting some adenoidal gangler with acne or one of those sinister little angel faces full of neurotic sensibility. The room was empty except for its finicky neatness and a rather large amount of livestock. There was nothing unusual about it. The school, according to the current trend, is run like a farm, with the boys doing the chores and pets are encouraged. There is a tank with a couple of turtles near the window, beside it another full of newts, and in one corner a glass cage of well-tended brisk white mice. Glass cases with carefully mounted seri- with carefully mounted series of Lepidoptera and Hymenoptera showing the metamorphic stages hung on the walls, and on a drawing board there was a daintily executed study of Branchippus, the fairy shrimp. Well, I pace, while I paced the room, trying to look as if I wasn't prying, a greenish little wretch, holding himself together as if he had an imaginary shawl draped around him, slunk into the half-dark room and squeaked, Hollowell? When I saw him, he... When he saw me, he started to duck, but I detained him and found that he had an appointment with Hallowell, too. But it was clear from his description that Hallowell must have been the redhead I'd seen leaving. The poor urchin burst into tears. I'll never get rid of it now, he wailed. And from then on, it was hard to get the whole maudlin story. It seemed that shortly after Hallowell's arrival at school, he acquired a reputation for unusual proficiency with animals and for out-of-the-way lore which would impress the ingenious. He circulated the rumor that he could swallow small animals and regurgitate them at will. No one actually saw him swallow anything, but it seems that in some mumbo-jumbo with another boy, he had shown cynicism about the whole thing. It was claimed that Hallowell had, well, divested himself of something and passed it on to the other boy, with the statement that the latter would only be able to get rid of his cargo when he, in turn, found a boy who would disbelieve him. The visitor paused, calmer now, and leaving the window, sat down again in the chair opposite the doctor, regarding him with such, fixity, with such fixity that the doctor shifted uneasily with the apprehension of one who was about to be asked for a loan. My mind turned to the elementary sort of thing we're all, we've all done at times. You know, circle the kids in the dark, piece of cooked cauliflower passed from hand to hand with the statement that the stuff is fresh brains of some neophyte who hadn't taken his initiation seriously. My young informer, or Molten, his name was, swore, however, that this hysteria, and of course that's what I thought, was passed on singly from boy to boy without any such seances. He'd been home to visit his family, who are missionaries on leave, and had been infected by his roommate on his return to school, unaware that by this time the whole school had protectively turned behaviors in mass. His own terror came not only from his conviction that he was possessed, but from his inability to find anybody who would take his dare, and so he'd finally come to Hollowell. By this time the room was getting really dark, and I snapped on the light to get a better look at Moulton, except for an occasional shudder, like a bodily tick, which I took to be the after-effects of hard crying. He looked like a healthy enough boy who'd been scared out of his wits. I remember that a neat little monograph was already forming itself in my mind. A group study on mass psychosis, perhaps with effective anthropological references to certain savage tribes whose dances include a rite known as eating evil. The kid was looking at me. Do you believe me? He said suddenly, Sir, he added with a naive cunning, which tickled me. Of course, I said, patting his shoulder absently. In a way, his shoulder slumped under my hand. I felt its tremor, distinct misery palpitating between my fingers. I thought maybe for a man it wouldn't be, his voice trailed off, be the same? I don't know, I said slowly, for of course... I was answering not his actual question, but the overtone of some cock-crow 
of meaning that evaded me. He raised his head and petitioned me silently with his eyes. Was it guile or simplicity in his look? And was it for conviction or the lack of it that he arraigned me? I don't know. I've gone back over what I did then again and again, using all my own knowledge of the mechanics of decision. And I know that it wasn't just sympathy or a pragmatic reversal of therapy, but something intimately important for me that made me shout with all my strength, of course I don't believe you. Molten, his face contorted, fell forward on me so suddenly that I stumbled backwards, sending the tank of newts crash into the floor. Supporting him with my arms, I hung on to him while he heaved face downwards. At the same time, I felt a tickling, sliding sensation in my own ear and an inordinate desire to follow it with my finger, but both my hands were busy. It wasn't a minute till I'd gotten him onto the couch where he drooped a little white about the mouth but with that chastened, purified look of the physically relieved, although he hadn't actually upchucked. Still watching him, I stooped to clear up the debris, but he bounded from the couch with amazing resilience. I'll do it, he said. Feel better? He nodded, clearly abashed, and we gathered up the remains of the tank in a sort of mutual embarrassment. I can't remember that either of us said a word, and neither of us made more than a half-hearted attempt to search for the scattered pests which had apparently sought crannies in the room. At the door we parted, muttering as formal a good night as was possible between a brown man and a small boy. It wasn't until I reached my own room and sat down that I realized not only my own extraordinary behavior, but that Moulton, standing as I suddenly recalled for the first time quite straight, had sent after me a look of pity and speculation. Out of habit, I reached into my breast pocket for my pencil in order to take notes as fresh as possible, and then I felt it, a skittering, sliding motion, almost beneath my hand. I opened my jacket and shook myself, thinking that I'd picked up something in the other room, but nothing. I sat quite still, gripping the pencil, and after an interval, it came again, an incohate creeping, a twitter of movement almost lackadaisical, as if something inching itself lazily along, but this time on my other side. In a frenzy, I peeled off my clothes, inspected myself wildly, and, enumerating to myself a reassuring abracadabra of explanation, skipped heartbeat, intercoastal pressure of gas, I sat there, naked, writing, and after a moment it came again, that wandering aquatic motion, as if something had flipped itself over, just enough to make me aware, and then settled itself this time under the sternum, with a nudge like that of some inconceivable photos. I jumped up and shook myself again, and as I did so, I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror, in the closet door. My face, my own face, was ajar with fright, and I was standing there, hooked over, as if I were wearing an imaginary shawl. In the silence after his visitor's voice stopped, the doctor sat there in the painful embarrassment of the listener who had played confessor and whose expected comment is a responsibility he wishes he had, evo he had evaded. The breeze from the open window fluttered the papers on the desk, glancing out at the clean rectangular facade of the hospital wing opposite at whose evenly shaded windows the white shapes of orderlies and nurses flickered in, cons in consoling routine. The doctor wished petulantly that he had fended off the man and all his papers in the beginning. What right had the man to arraign him, surprised by his own inner vehemence? He pulled himself together. How long ago, he said at last. Four months. And since? It's never stopped, the visitor now seemed brimming with a tentative excitement, like a colleague discussing a mutually puzzling case. Everything's been tried. Sedatives do obtain some sleep, but that's all. Purgatives, even emetics. He laughed slightly, almost with pride. Nothing like that works. He continued shaking his head with the dotting fondness of a patient for some symptom, which has confounded the best of them. It's too cagey for that. With his use of the word it, the doctor was propelled back into that shapely sense of reality which had gone admittedly askew during the man's recital. To admit the category of it, to dip even a slightly cooperative finger in another's fantasy, 
was to risk one's own equilibrium, better not to become involved in argument with the possessed, lest one's own aperture as a belief be found to have been left ajar. I'm afraid, the doctor said blandly, that your case is outside my field. As a doctor, said his visitor, or as a man? Let's not discuss me, if you please. The visitor leaned intently across the desk. Then you admit that to a certain extent we have been... I admit nothing, said the doctor, stiffening. Well, said the man disparagingly, of course, that too is a kind of stand. The commonest I've found, he sighed, pressing one hand against his collarbone. I suppose you have a prescription too, or a recommendation? Most of them do. The doctor did not enjoy being judged. Why don't you hunt up young Hallowell, he said with malice. Disappeared. Don't you think I tried? Said his vis-a-vis ruefully. Something furtive, hope perhaps, spread its guileful corruption over his face. That means you do give a certain credence? Nothing of the sort. Well then, said his interrogator, turning his palms upward. The doctor leaned forward, measuring his words with exasperation. Do you mean you want me to tell you you're crazy? In my spot, answered his visitor meekly. Which would you prefer? Badgered to the point of commitment, the doctor stared back at his inconvenient Diogenes. Swollen with irritation, he was only half conscious of an uneasy vestigial twitching of his ear muscles, which contracted now as they sometimes did when he listened to atonal music. Okay, okay, he shouted suddenly, slapping his hand down on the desk and thrusting his chin forward. Have it your way, then. I don't believe you. Rigid, the man looked back at him cataleptically, seeming for a moment all eye, then his mouth stretching in that medieval grimace, resorial and equivocal, whose mask appears sometimes on one side of the stage, sometimes on the other. He fell forward on the desk with long, with a long, mewing sigh. Before the doctor could reach him, he had raised himself on his arms, and their foreheads touched. They recoiled, staring downward, between them on the desk, as if one of its mahogany shadows had become animate. Something seemed to move, small, steel-colored, and ambiguous. For a moment, it filmed back and forth, arching in a crude, primordial inquiry, then, homing straight for the doctor, whose jaw hung down in a rictus of shock, it disappeared from view. Sputtering, the doctor beat the air and his own person wildly with his hands and staggered upward from the chair. The breeze blew hypnotically, and the stranger gazed back at him with such perverse calm that he already felt an assailing doubt of the lightning untoward event He fumbled back over his sensations of a minute before, but already piecemeal and chimerical, they eluded him now as they might forever. It's unbelievable, he said weakly. His visitor put up a warding hand, shaking it fastidiously. Ah, contraire, he replied daintily, as though by the use of another language he would remove himself still further from commitment. Reaching forward, he gathered up his papers, into a sheaf and stood up, stretching himself straight with an all-over bodily yawn of physical ease, though it was like an affront. He looked back at the doctor, one hand fingering his wallet. No, he said reflectively. Guess not. He tucked the papers away. Shall we leave it on the basis of her professional courtesy? He inquired delicately. Choking on the sludge of his rage, the doctor looked back at him, inarticulate. Moving toward the door, the visitor paused. After all, he said, with your connections... Try to think of it as a temporary inconvenience. Regretfully, happily, he closed the door behind him. The doctor sat at his desk, humped forward. His hands crept to his chest and crossed. He swallowed experimentally. He hoped it was rage. He sat there waiting. He was thinking of the luncheon table. And that's the end.